Father, we cannot thank you enough for your plan of redemption. We can't thank you enough for your love, for peace, for hope, for faith, for joy, and for the advent of your Son. Jesus, what you have done for us literally will go down in the annals of history for all time as the single greatest thing ever done for anyone. And we love you and we praise you for that. We pray, Lord, as we go through your word today, as we remember your birth and your life and your goal and your plan and your kingship, that we would love you more, that we would know a little more about you, and that we would be even more excited to tell others about the hope that we have and the love that we have for our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. All right, Christmas 2022. Is it just me or does it seem like it was just last week when Mary was telling us, we're going to keep a couple of Christmas items up here so that we can keep Christmas alive in our hearts all year. That seems like last week, but it wasn't. It was a year ago. Man, the years go fast, huh? Amen. For those of you who are young, uh, my wife and I were talking to my son on the way here. It was in, in, he's somewhere. <laughs> El Paso, thank you. I always forget that. But he was talking about how as he's getting older, he thought things were going to get easier. And I, and I explained to him, I was always taught that as you get older, life gets slower, things get easier. And boy, do I feel like to. So for you young ones, enjoy the time. As you get older, the years go by faster and faster. <laughs> so Christmas, Christ Mass. The celebration, the worship of Jesus Christ. The remembrance of Christ's first advent as a babe, born in Bethlehem, destined to change all things. Over the centuries, the celebration of Jesus' advent has taken many different forms while being saddled and attached with many different traditions and symbols. Some accurate, others not so much. As Christians, we are, not immune to, we are not immune to this. We're not immune to, to tradition, accurate or inaccurate. We do have, ever, have the source of accuracy and the knowledge of what is important for us to know right at our fingertips, which is your Bible. Now, for those of you who were with us last week, we talked about God's plan and how it related to construction there was one part of that plan that was left out for this week, and that is a construction plan, a well-thought-out one, is designed to be self-correcting. In other words, if there's a conflict between the general condition and the notes, between the specifications and the drawings, there's a specific process. It's called an RFI, Request for Information. So as the builder or the inspector comes against in contact with something that information doesn't jive, the specific process is that you send out an RFI request for information. You don't send the RFI to your butcher or to your banker or to the guy who mows your lawn. You send the RFI to the designer, to the one who knows, amen? In this process, the whole construction plan should be self-correcting. You eliminate errors along the way by going to the source to get accurate information or correct conflicts. Now in God's world, God's world and his word, there are no problems, there are no errors, there are no conflicts. As Christians, we should be constantly sending out RFIs, requests for information, not to correct errors, but to bring clarity and cohesion between God's word. All of it. Genesis to Revelation is self-correcting. You will find answers for all heresies already written down for you to find. Amen? Christmas is no exception. We, as Jerry brought out last night, there are so many societal and traditional things that are not accurate. But what is accurate and what is important is what we find in the Word of God. Amen? Amen? 
Turn with me, if you will, to Malachi chapter 4. Now, for those of you who don't know where that is, go to Matthew and make a left. It is the very last book of your Old Testament. In fact, it's the very last chapter of the very last book of your Old Testament. Malachi chapter 4. Malachi chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, and all the proud, yes, all who do wickedly, will be stubble. And the day which is coming shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts, that will leave them neither root nor branch. But to you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings, and you shall grow out and grow fat like stall-fed calves. You shall trample the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day that I do this, says the Lord of hosts. Remember the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded him in Horeb for all Israel, with the statutes and judgments. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. This was the last time that the word of the Lord came to a prophet in the Old Testament. What followed was 400 years of darkness and trauma. Gentile kingdoms and empires raged wars back and forth across the continent with Israel in the middle, trampling them back and forth in their conquests. The Israelites were dominated first by one kingdom, then another, then another, and so on and so forth. All the while they were waiting for Malachi chapter 4 verses 2 and 3 to come to pass, which says, But to you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings, and you shall go out and grow fat like stall-fed calves. You shall trample the wicked, they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day that I do this, says the Lord of hosts. God knew the wait would be long, and so he encouraged them with Malachi 4, verse 4. Remember the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded him in Horeb for all Israel with his statutes and judgments. Now God knew it was going to be 400 years. And we're still ringing, by the way. But God encouraged them to remember the law, to remember the scriptures, to remember the statutes that he commanded them. But I'm certain as the years turned into decades and the decades turned into centuries, many were tempted to say, just as Peter writes in 2 Peter 3, where's the promise of this coming? For since the fathers have fallen asleep, all things continue as they were to this day. I'm going to sing a song, and as I'm doing that, I want you to try to feel the desperation that the Israelites would have been feeling, what they might have been going through as they waited and waited and waited. And as I sing that, I'm going to light our candles. Now, you recall these candles, faith, hope, love, peace, and Christ's advent. These were all things that although the decades seemed to stretch out and the days seemed to get darker and darker, God had a plan. And in the background, working behind the scenes, even though it seemed to men it was taking forever, God's plan was actually ramping up. And the time was getting closer and closer. Of Jesus Christ. What was dark days hopeless, terrifying. We're waiting, waiting, waiting for the advent of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords to explode into our world. <laughs> and again, as Peter wrote in 2 Peter 3, verses 3 and 4, Knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts. Now you can bet there were scoffers in Israel 
scoffing at the promises of his coming. When Peter writes, saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Folks, we are in the same spot today that Israel was then. Because there are many people, even many within the church, they're saying, Where is the promise of his coming? Jesus said, in returning, we just need to make the world all good. Well, folks, Jesus is coming. Amen. 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 And the source document in the Bible makes that extremely clear. Amen. All you've got to do is read it. Amen. Amen. And in Israel's days, those who feared the name of the Lord waited faithfully. Yes, they were dark days. And every decade and every century grew ever darker, yet still they waited in faith. And when the days were darkest and the time was right, God acted. Galatians 4, verses 1 through 6. I'll let you turn there. Galatians 4, verses 1 through 6. Brother Jerry read these to us last night, but you, you can't get tired of hearing God's word, amen? amen. Galatians 4, verses 1 through 6. Now I say that an heir, as long as he's a child, does not differ at all from a slave, though he's master of all. But is under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the Father. Get that. The time appointed by the Father. This is not a random action. This is a specific time appointed. Even so, we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, that fullness of time means the fullness of time. When all things were complete, the time was right, it was appointed, it was exact, it was not accidental. Amen. When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Amen. Turn with me to Luke chapter 2, please. Luke chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. The census first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, unto Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. And so it was, while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth, forth her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling cloths. You know, those aren't princely rags. Those aren't diapers. Those aren't anything other than lamb's cloths. The King of kings and the Lord of lords was laid in a food trough and wrapped in rags. Mm. She wrapped him in swaddling cloths, laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. Amen. Amen. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, laying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And so it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven, that the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe laying in a manger. Now when they'd seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all who heard it marveled at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things 
and pondered them in her heart. Then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen as it was told them. And when eight days were completed for the circumcision of the child, his name was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. Now when the days of her purification according to the law of Moses were completed, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law, every male who opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name is Simeon. And this man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he saw the Lord's Christ. So he came by the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do this according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and he blessed God and he said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all people, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. Then Simeon blessed him and said to Mary his mother, Behold, this child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and for a sign which we be spoken of. Yes, a sword will pierce through your own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Now there was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel, the tribe of Asher. She was of great age and had lived with a husband seven years from her virginity. And this woman was a widow of about 84 years who did not depart from the temple but served God with fasting and prayers day and night. And coming in that instant, she gave thanks to the Lord and spoke of him and all those who looked for redemption in Jerusalem. So when they had performed all these things according to the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own city, Nazareth. In the darkest days possible, light exploded into the world. And this was foretold in Isaiah 9, chapter 2. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light has shined. What's interesting about this, those words, a great light, are only found together in Scripture three places. One here in Isaiah 9, 2. In Matthew chapter 4, verses 13 through 17, I'll just read them to you. Speaking of Jesus, and leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is by the sea, in the region of Zebulun and Naphtali, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of by Isaiah the prophet, saying, The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light, and upon those who sat in the region, the shadow of death, light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. So Jesus quotes Isaiah 9 2, and him being there as a fulfillment of prophecy. There's one other time that these words, Great Light, appear, and that's in Acts chapter 22, where Paul is relaying his story of his visitation with Jesus. Acts 22, verse 6. Now it happened as I journeyed and came near Damascus at about noon, suddenly a great light from heaven shone around me, and I fell to the, a great light. That's the third instance. I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? So I answered and said, Who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus, whom you persecute. The great light is none other than Jesus Christ himself. I want to remind you guys of something we discussed when we were opening the book of Genesis. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and without void, and the Spirit of God hovered over the face of the darkness. And God said, let there be light. Now we tend to think of that as God created light. That's not accurate. 
What it literally says is, let light be. Loose it. What light? Was it the sun? Nope. The sun wasn't created for a few days. Was it the stars of the universe? Nope. They weren't created yet. The light that God loosed into His creation was His light, His glory, Jesus Christ. Amen. The great light. Now, the proclamation of the birth of Christ was a very public thing. It was announced to young, to old, to rich and poor, male and female, priest and shepherd, and yes, even kings. In one instant, one split second, the one whom Malachi had foretold was here. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things. Now what do you think that means in the Greek? All things. All. The whole. The every. All. Inclusive. All things were made through Him. And without Him, nothing was made that was made. What do you think nothing means? Nothing. nothing. <laughs> quite often we like, I don't say we like to, but quite often we see people fool around with their Bibles, with the wording in their Bibles to create a meaning, to create a God in their own image. The words are the words, amen. Without Him, nothing was made that was made. In Him was life. And the life was the light of men. Just as in the beginning God said, let light be. And His glory shone into His creation. When Jesus stepped into this world, it was the same thing. Let light be. Loose it. Mm. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came into his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name. Who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. The glory as of the only begotten Father, full of grace, full of truth. Amen? Bam! Light was here. In a world of despair, the light had come. But what about Jesus? Now, you guys have been with us a while. You might have heard me preach Sundays about light exploding into the world and the change that it instantly made. But what about Jesus? While we are so appreciative of Christ's life, His death, and His resurrection to be our Lord and our Savior, is there more? There's a lot more. Let's think about that for just a few minutes. We know that light, Jesus, stepped into the darkness to light up the world. But what we don't often realize is that although the light was not subject to darkness, get that clear, the light was not subject to darkness, He was affected by it. He was touched by it. He was surrounded by it. He was inundated by it. He was in its presence. The creator of the heavens and earth, all powerful God the Son, was now in a place where darkness could affect him. We don't usually think that way. Jesus, God the Son, stepped into our world through the process of birth. The Holy Spirit produced a baby in Mary's womb, where he grew and formulated into a complete baby child, just like all of us. That's how we got here. Not by the Holy Spirit, but that's how we got here. <laughs> Jesus had to be born just like us. Anyone who has watched that process knows that is messy and painful. For I believe for both the mother and the child. Amen. And this Jesus had to do. 
Jesus was born in a humble place, a barn or a stable, because there was no room in the inn. He was laid in a manger, a food trough. Any of you guys been around livestock? A food trough is not a nice thing. It's nasty. It's bugs and slobber and stuff. It's not nice. That's where he was laid. Definitely not the princely place you would think the king of kings would enter the world. He was wrapped in swaddling cloths, rags. Not the garment of a king. He had to rely on his earthly parents for everything. Think about that. The one who created the heavens and the earth needed to have his diaper changed. Needed to be fed. Needed to be taught to walk. To talk. He had to rely on his parents for everything. He also learned some things that you wouldn't expect God to learn. He learned obedience. Scripture tells us this. He learned obedience to the Father, and he learned obedience to his earthly mother and father, stepfather. He learned faith through experience. He also learned what it was to be fully man and suffer all the things that mankind suffers. Yet think about common things. He was a carpenter. I'm sure he smashed his thumb with a hammer once or twice. He stubbed his toe. He got sunburned. He slipped and fell. He got bruised. He got hungry. He got tired. He got weary. He felt anxiety like no one has ever felt before. Remember the Garden of Gethsemane? Sweating great drops of blood. He learned the joy of personal acceptance and love. Personal, one-on-one, -on -one, with his disciples, with his family, with those who loved him. He also learned the anguish of personal, face-to-face, eye-to-eye, rejection and hatred. You know, it's one thing for someone to be out there. Now, younger people might not get this. You older people, you're going to get this. It's one thing for someone to be on the Internet or on Facebook or a friend of a friend talking bad about you and rejecting you or whatever people do to make you feel bad. For me, I don't care. Facebook, footbook, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It's, they're out there. They're doing their thing. It's a, whatever they do, they do. Face to face and eye to eye is more impactful. Amen? In a world that rejected God from afar, suddenly they were rejecting Him face to face, eye to eye, right here, right now. He learned that. He felt that. Hebrews 4, 14 through 16. It says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who can't sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. You realize Jesus Submitted himself to being subjected to weaknesses. Cold, heat, food, those kind of things. He subjected himself to that. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. There is a man sitting on the right hand of God the Father on the throne of heaven who knows exactly what you're going through. And he did what he did so that he could sit on that throne knowing exactly what you're going through. Amen. He was tempted in all things that we were tempted and yet without sin. He suffered all things humanly possible so that he could understand what we go through. And so he could provide a way for us to survive them and thrive. I come that you have life and life more abundantly. Amen. Here's the crazy thing. Jesus Christ, God the Son, Learned what it meant to be subjected to 
time. You guys understand time is a physical dimension. Mass times velocity. God is not subject to time because God created time. I, I call it God's bubble. Time is God's bubble. God created time. He's outside of time. Remember, God remembers tomorrow because he's already been there. Time for God is not linear. We look at time as all the way from the left, all the way to the right. It's one line that just stretches out for, for a long, long ways. That's not time. Time is a circle. Time is a creation by God in this universe that we live in that God is not subject to. God can step into tomorrow. He can step into last Wednesday. He can step into 10 years from now. He can step back to creation. God is not subject. He looks at time, decides where he wants to insert himself, and there he is. Jesus Christ becoming a man, taking on a physical body that had mass, suddenly became subject to time. That's a mind blower. Jesus had to wait for tomorrow the same way that you do. This is God who never had to wait for anything. He could be in tomorrow yesterday. I know. <laughs> but he put himself in a position he had to wait for tomorrow. He had to follow the plan to obey the Father's will, to take one step after another, one day after another, one year after another, while fulfilling the plan of redemption. There were no shortcuts. There was no sidestepping the time, no cheating. By the way, that's what the three temptations of Satan were. There were shortcuts. There were cheats. They were trying to convince Jesus, bypass the cross, take what I give you, shortcut, cheat. And we all know how that went for him. <laughs> the point is this. For us, the greatest event in history is when light stepped into darkness and we're redeemed. Amen? Amen? For Jesus, the worst time he will ever face is that time that he stepped into darkness and was impacted by it. And as Jerry preached last night, it pleased the Father to bruise the Son on our behalf. Jesus was not only affected and impacted but for a brief time, he was overcome by darkness because you and I would have been overcome by darkness. Hmm. Just like us, the worst time he will ever have is the time he spent here on earth as a man and also the time after that, his death and resurrection. We often say, for those who know the Lord, this is our hell. This is the worst time we'll ever face. Think about it from his perspective. The one who owned everything, the one who had everything, all powerful, all knowing, put himself in a position for 33 and a half years to be subjected to the laws of physics, time, and legal laws that he himself created. It's <laughs> but he willingly did all of this out of love. Again, Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. Therefore also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Make no mistake, Jesus knew exactly what he was facing. Before the foundation of the world, the plan of redemption was put in place, and Jesus knew fully well what that cost would be before he created us. I don't know about you guys, but I wouldn't create anything that was going to require that kind of sacrifice from me. Amen. And let's just be real, we're human. If, if I looked out through time and saw that was going to be the cost, I'd say, now nah, I'm going to make something else. <laughs> I'll make something better. But his love is boundless. Lastly, Jesus, God the Son, learned what it meant to be changed. 
So what do you mean by that? Revelation chapter 5. I'll let you turn there. This is important. Revelation 5. Verse 1. Revelation 5 verse 1. And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back sealed with seven seals. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. So I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or even to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loosen its seven seals. And I look, and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures, in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as though it had been slain. You realize Jesus Christ still bears the scars in his body that he suffered on that cross. The only man-made things in heaven are the scars on his body. Jesus Christ, God the Son, eternal from before the vanishing point, became a man, and he stayed a man. Fully God, fully man. He is still to this day fully God and fully man. After his resurrection, he appeared to the disciples. Touch me, am I not flesh and bone? He didn't use the word blood. Am I not flesh and bone? Jesus still carries a physical body, and that body bears the scars of what he did for you and I. Jesus Christ willingly changed his condition. Did not change his godhood. He's still God the Son. But he changed his physical condition for eternity. What great love is that? <sighs> mm. Christmas story. Luke chapter 1, verse 1. Luke 1, 1. Inasmuch as many have taken in hand to set in order a narrative of those things which have been fulfilled among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write to you an orderly account, most excellent Theophilus, that you may know the certainty of those things in which you were instructed. There was in the days of King Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the division of Abijah. His wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. But they had no child, because Elizabeth was barren. And they were both well advanced in years. And so it was that while he was serving as priest before God in the order of his division, according to the custom of the priesthood, his lot fell to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. And the whole multitude of the people was praying outside at the hour of incense. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And by the way, don't worry about uh, the identity of this angel. He's going to identify himself very clearly here in just a second. While Zacharias saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your prayer is heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He will also be filled from the Holy Spirit, filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. He will also go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. Remember Malachi chapter 4? Boom, here you go. And the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And Zechariah said to the angel, How shall I know this? 
for I am an old man, and my wife is well advanced in years. And the angel answered and said to him, I am Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God, and was sent to speak to you and bring you these glad tidings. Ooh. But behold, you will be mute and will not be able to speak until the day these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their own time. And the people waited for Zacharias and marveled that he lingered so long in the temple. When he came out, he could not speak to them, and they perceived that he had seen a vision in the temple, for he beckoned to them and remained speechless. And so it was as soon as the days of his service were completed that he departed to his own house. Now after those days his wife Elizabeth conceived, and she hid herself five months, saying, Thus the Lord has dealt with me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach among people. Boy, is that an understatement or what? How would you like to be known historically as a mother of John the Baptist? Wow, that's a close second only to being Mary, the mother of our Lord and Savior Jesus. Amen? Mm. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. Having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb, and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great, and will be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. Then Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I do not know a man? And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is now the sixth month for her who was called barren. For with God, nothing will be impossible. Amen. Amen. Then Mary said, Behold, the maidservant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Scripture, or let me back up. The Holy Spirit has been very intent in Scripture to let Israel know of the coming of the One, the coming of Jesus. The prophecies were certain, and they were fulfilled in the exact time, in the exact way that God promised. And that's thrilling. But do you know you are recipients of hundreds and hundreds of prophecies as well? Amen? Just as Jesus appeared in Israel, boom, a light shining in darkness. He's returning yes. with your name on his lips to call you that where he is, you may be also. And after that, he's returning again with you to, re to save and restore the nation of Israel and to rule and reign from this planet, from the throne of his father, David. Just as they said in Israel, and Peter warns us, the last days many will come saying, where's the promise of his coming? Kind of paraphrasing, hey, it's been too long. We've, we've been waiting way too long. I mean, I've been waiting 30 years. What's God thinking? Doesn't he know how long 30 years is? Come on, Lord, chop, chop. <laughs> we are further removed from the cross of Christ, as Nate pointed out last Wednesday. We are further removed from the cross of Christ than Adam was from the flood. 1,656 years between Adam and the flood, it's been over 2,000 from the cross. But that does not negate the promise, does it? As the angel said, Behold, this same Jesus whom you see going into heaven, this same Jesus shall return. Amen? Amen. So while we celebrate the baby in the manger, and it is fantastic, it's awesome. The reason we celebrate isn't because a child was born, because they're born all the time. 
We celebrate because a son was given. The pre-existing God, the son, was given to us as a baby so that he could grow up, so that he could live a perfect, sinless life on our behalf because we could never do that. And so that he could be sacrificed a perfect, spotless lamb to pay the price of sin which we could never pay. So that he could explode that grave on the third day and say, death has no hold on me. I have conquered death and because he has conquered death, we can conquer death through his name. Amen. So, Merry Christmas. Happy birthday, Jesus. Lord, we pray that as we leave this place today, as we finish this day with our family, and not just this day, but hopefully throughout the coming year, we'll continue to remember that your birth, your advent, that manger scene was just the beginning. It was the beginning of, a, of an eternal story in which you will rule and reign forever, in which you will have those who love you and those whom you have redeemed to be with you forever, that where you are, we may be also. Lord, we await anxiously the return of our King of Kings and our Lord of Lords. We wait for the day that we will see you face to face, be able to touch you and thank you in person for all that you've done for us. We love you so much, and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.
That was beautiful. Would you stand with us? We're going to sing one more song, Christmas carol together, and then have a very Merry Christmas. Thank you guys.